Manzanar, California, in eastern Inyo County, was the first of 10 camps throughout the nation where roughly 120,000 people of Japanese descent were sent during World War II. Though internment camps are often mentioned in our history books, they tend to stick to a certain narrative, a narrative that those forced there went without much resistance. The truth, however, is a lot more complicated. And it is beautifully detailed in a new graphic novel titled We Hereby Refuse, Japanese-American Resistance to Wartime Incarceration. I recently spoke with authors Frank Abe and Tamiko Nimura. Nimura began by telling me how she first learned about this dark chapter in American history. My dad and his family were incarcerated at Tsui Lake, and I think camp came up in family gatherings, family conversations, but my dad was also a librarian, and so he brought home a lot of books, and uh, one of them was Yoshiko Uchida's book, Journey to Topaz, and um, with its sequel, Journey Home, um, my dad and I got to meet the author, Yoshiko Uchida, and I think it was really... Um, then that I started to really figure out more about what this story was about. Um, and uh, after a little while, my dad actually gave me an unpublished memoir that he'd written of his time in camp. Hmm. And so I learned about it from that perspective as well. Yeah. And I think that just goes to the notion, Frank Abe, that there was definitely a lot of untold history here. And I think the common narrative that, that a lot of people might have is that, oh, these, you hear, were people that were sent off to these camps, and they just went, and that was the end of the story, because there were no other options. Why was it so important for you to get out a, a very different and yet very important version of history? Because growing up, Alex, uh, we had uh, two uh, accepted notions of how Japanese Americans responded to this mass injustice. One was and it can be summed up in, in two Japanese terms. One was shikate ganai, mm. Japanese for it can't Shogunai. be helped. Yeah. Uh, passive resignation in the face of injustice. Uh, the other was go for broke, uh, patriotic self-sacrifice in order to prove one's loyalty. Uh, in their words at the time, uh, spilling one's blood for America. And, and neither of those two uh, polar extremes seemed, rang true to me. So um, when I learned of the resistors, uh, uh, when I was a gr fully grown, um, it was it, the missing link uh, to, for me that uh, needed to be uh, documented. Mm -hmm. So that's what we did. Yeah. And there are three characters uh, in this book that really demonstrate this notion of we hereby refuse. Tamiko, I want people to get this book. I want them to read it. So if you could just give us a little teaser about who, of these, uh, who these three people were and what they did. We have Jimikutsu from Seattle, who uh, resisted the draft based on a changed citizenship status. Um, he's also known as the inspiration for John Okada's novel, No No Boy. Uh, we have Mitsuya Endo, who contested the constitutionality of incarceration um, and went all the way to, to the Supreme Court with her case and was successful. And we have Hiroshi Kashiwagi, who um, resisted government pressure to sign a loyalty oath that the government issued and ultimately renounced his United States citizenship. And he's my uncle. And there's all sorts of ways that you could tell their story. Frank, why choose the graphic novel format to tell this particular tale? Well, that was the commission that was given to us by the Wingloop Museum of Seattle. So it was it was that that was the uh, the contract. Uh, but it was a wonderful opportunity I'm a filmmaker uh, and, and a writer, and uh, to, it was an opportunity to take the ideas uh, and visualize them for the reader uh, in much in the manner of um, the storyboards for a motion picture. Uh, and visualizing the story just brings it alive. There is um, another book, uh, Years of Infamy by Michi Wegwin that uh, came out in the 70s, that was the first to really expose the story of Tule Lake uh, and the stockade of Tule Lake. And I always felt that there was a movie in, in, in the voices that Michi captured in her book. Um, but, the, and the, but these stories have, have sat there for what, 40, 50 years, uh, and people read them, but they don't really feel them. And mm -hmm. so the opportunity to tell the story visually 
uh, all of a sudden just opens up the story, brings it alive, and and that's what you, that's what you see in our book. Yeah. When you talk about that, I think that's a really interesting distinction between reading something and feeling something. And I would imagine for both of you, there was there were moments working on this project where you might have really connected with what happened and maybe even thought about, OK, if I were in this situation, what might I have done in similar circumstances? And maybe we can hear from both of you, Tamika, first. Is there a particular moment in this book or, or a moment in working on this project that really resonated with you on this front? Sure. There was a moment, particularly when I was reading about Mitsuya Endo's case and the decisions that she made in order to let that case go forward. And from what we could tell, she was clearly quite terrified mm -hmm. <laughs> um, to uh, make certain decisions, right? Uh, couldn't others go forward with this case? Um, should I leave camp? Um, and go elsewhere just to get out of camp and not let my case go forward. But I really felt that she somehow made this path through her fear, and I really appreciated that, particularly given the conditions under which we've been living and resisting for the last four years. I was really moved by her quiet strength. Mm -hmm. Frank, how about you? And, and Alex, uh, uh, with Monsieur Endo, uh, the, the opportunity here was to bring her character to life, to show you who she was as a person. This has never been seen before, because until now, uh, the name Endo versus U.S. has only been a name on court briefs, again, in history books. Uh, and so, you know, we actually had to do our own research to understand who she was, uh, what she was like as a person, uh, I had a chance to go talk to her son in Chicago, for example, and also the daughter of her attorney, to tell the story in personal terms so that we understand who Mitsuya Endo was as a person. And of course, projects like these, they take long periods of time, and you would have had no way of knowing when you first got into all of this that it would be published at a time where incidents of hate against Asian Americans has just really been soaring, especially here in California. I'd love to hear briefly from both of you, and, and Tamika, let's start with you. How do you hope this really resonates with people here in California in the year 2021? Well, I'm originally from California, so I still have very deep roots there. and. I hope that everybody really understands that this is just part of a longer record of anti-Asian racism, anti-Asian discrimination, anti-Asian hate. This is not new. A lot of what's what we're seeing in the graphic, what we saw in the graphic novel, a lot of what we documented in the graphic novel are things that are quite resonant today. Alex, I grew up in the Bay Area, uh, so this is very familiar to me as well. What, what the book does, though, is it it squarely addresses race as the one characteristic that was common to all 120,000 persons who were locked up in World War II. And race is still dividing us today. So as Tomiko says, the, the history, the same elements of uh, exclusion and racism that existed in 1942 uh, and that were triggered by Pearl Harbor leading to the incarceration, uh, those events are still being triggered today. Frank Abe and Tamiko Nimura, they are the co-authors of the new work titled We Hereby Refuse. Oscara Samades, thank you for this beautiful work. Thank you for taking the time out to speak with us. Thank you, Alex. Thank, thank you for having us.